Okay. Now we've got him. Okay. Hi. Uh, I don't know what's going on with Jeff and the computer at the moment, but we can try to solve that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, anyway, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Silver Linings panel. This is something that I'm very passionate about because it's part of sharing my story. And obviously, I've got these two people waiting for us um, to share their job. Uh, so, thank you again to John, Joe, and Jeff, when you get here, for doing this and taking the time out of the day. Um, uh, a quick, quick, in quick sentence, if you can, um, just introduce yourself, who you are, and what you do for anybody that doesn't actually make that. So, Ron, go ahead. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Here she comes. Right, isn't it? Right. I'm really right. to see all my living room here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go for it, John. In the who you are and what is you do? So I'm Dom. I'm uh, from Manchester, and I am a founder of a business called Social Chain. We are a social media marketing business, um, and we went public in October. Uh, founded the business in 2021. Um, we've been doing that And who? So I am Joe Thompson, um, former professional footballer um, and now motivational speaker. I've also got a book out at the moment called Darkness and Light, so uh, the title published author as well. Um, and yeah, I've obviously do my best to try and inspire not just corporate, but also within the footballing world and within schools as well. And lastly, Jeff? Okay. <laughs> Technology, everybody is on the computers <laughs> at this moment in time. And she's gone. Right. right. I'm not sure what's just happened there. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start anyway with the first question, which is for, towards you, Joe. Of course, we're here. Yeah where you can rise from the university and use it to be the star of the story, essentially. And see you and your community back in plants at one, but twice. And you, you, you came on top, you completed it. So I want to know, like, when, when you first found out, presumably you were a very fit and healthy young guy, your professional footballer, like just that I was. How did you feel when you first got on you? Um, so the first time was back in 2013. Um, like you say, young, fit and healthy. Uh, I just had my little girl with my partner, Chantel. Uh, so everything was perfect. And, you know, I really had dreams and aspirations to, you know, kick on and, get myself up the league. I was at Tranmere Rovers at the time. We were flying high in League One and had aspirations to get to the championship. And it just all turned on its head within the space of, I'd say, two weeks. I started to feel very, very unwell. Uh, and then when I spoke to the club doctor and the physio, they straight away sent me off for a biopsy. And within four days, I was with a specialist and he told me that I'd had Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, which is effectively a cancer of your immune system and I was stage 4S and I probably had it for three years so shock um, totally gone into that appointment with naivety um, and also as a footballer you tend to think you're, you're invincible particularly when it comes to your health um, so yeah it was um, a day that I don't tend to like to relive but um, a day that I'll forever remember. How did you feel 
at, at that very particular at that very moment um i'd always prided myself on being the rock and the provider um for my family and i just thought straight away like i am going to need so much help and support here because obviously i've been playing football thinking that everything's fine and fundamentally um i've got a massive fight on my hands yeah and hello hi she's in she's <laughs> And Joe, that, that, so did that differ the second time you found out that you had cancer, or, or was it any better or was it worse? Second time was far worse. Um, we're talking three years on, where I'd obviously overcome it and had that sense of relief after six months worth of chemotherapy, um, and I'd got my life back on track. Hmm. So it was um, the second time I was really angry. Um, I'd built up a relationship with the doctors and the specialists and whatnot, and they did. They tried their best to tell me, um, but they told me on uh, Christmas Eve, two thousand and sixteen. Yeah. Um, so you get wrapped up in, you know, that Christmas festive season, and I was looking forward to spending some time with the family. Just went for this last scan and routine check, and yeah, they just told me that the cancer had come back. Um, and the positive was it was the same cancer I had prior, but the obvious issue was here that I was going to have to undergo so much more treatment and also spend um, some time in isolation and have a stem cell transplant. So it was a lot to take in at the time. And thankfully for me, my wife was there to, you know, ask the right questions, I suppose. Yeah. And do you got your... Really, four years over, which is an amazing achievement. Congratulations for that. Thank you. What is it that led you to the point where you, I mean, if you don't mind me saying, became almost reliant on alcohol? Yeah. That's a great way to put it. I ultimately became dependent on alcohol. Um, I was, for us to rely on running normal life, and then, and then uh, that's and, and quickly a lot of it came and things I for me to handle. Um, and I found myself turning to my medicine. Oh, great. Um, have you got any headphones or anything? Yeah, I'm going to have to find some. So right. Okay. We'll come back to the we'll come back to, to John. Uh, Jess, you know you are, you are Hello, like. um, your whole, from what I know, from what I've seen, your business is mostly what to to from adversity, which is what we're speaking about. Um, what is it that you, sorry, where do you draw your personal inspiration from to pass on the knowledge that you do to people? Oh God, there's a question. <laughs> Myself, no, I'm joking. Um, do you know what's really weird? I've always had a huge interest in mental well-being, self-help, self-development. And I never really knew or understood where that actually came from or why I had these interests. And then throughout the years, a lot of things sort of transpired. Um, and two weeks before I went into The Apprentice, a load of childhood repressed memories had come back. And I was like, what the hell? And then I suppressed them again. I was like, oh, put it in a box, deal with it later. Had a bit of a mental breakdown. Like when I came out of The Apprentice, out of Big Brother, um, chased the fame, trying to get validation from something um, when really I needed to find that validation in myself. And then, well, a couple of years after that, all this, these memories came back and I'm trying to suppress them. Um, we had another tragedy in the family with um, with, with my girl's father, um, dying and then that was really the turning point where i was just like what am i doing and everything just came crashing down I had a complete breakdown i was like man i need to build myself back up and that's really when i started putting into practice everything that i had done in the past through um, development through self-help and um, focus back on my business because I, I definitely definitely lost my way uh, to do the television stuff really <laughs> i went a bit crazy <laughs> Um, but yeah, came back and then I uh, um, became a practitioner in a few techniques called NLP, EFT, matrix reimprinting. Um, 
and that stuff really changed my life. And then I started merging the practical therapy um, stuff with the business stuff. And that's where the coaching blossomed from, should I say. So, yeah, I mean, going back to that, see, we, we missed you right at the start. So what can you encompass what you do in a sentence or two? Yes. So I'm a business mindset and strategy coach. Um, so sometimes a business owner will get me in to help implement certain things to help the business grow. Um, other times a corporate company will get me in to streamline a few things or to see where they can cut back on money or make money. Um, or then I get individuals like the hot uh, talk. Then I get individuals asking me to do mindset techniques. So a lot of people, a lot of my clients who aren't business clients, who aren't corporates, um, they often suffer with not feeling like they're good enough. Um, they have a lot of limiting beliefs. Um, money blocks, that's always a big one. And what happens, our subconscious, when we have certain beliefs about ourselves, it's generally because we've experienced certain traumas in our life. And in that moment of trauma, we create a belief and we, our subconscious then starts protecting us so it doesn't happen again. But the thing with that is all our main beliefs are formed from, from our early years, 0 to 6. And when we're 0 to 6, we don't have the same rational brain as we do when we're 33 with children. So often enough, you have a child that is playing every single day through your subconscious in the adult life. So unless you get rid of how the child is feeling or, or help the child that's stuck in this trauma, it always plays in your subconscious. And this is why we have these stories that we tell ourselves. This is why we act certain ways. Um, if people suffer with depression or anxiety, it's often to do with certain experiences throughout their life that they've held on to and not actually process the trauma. Hmm. I mean, I've waffled there, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm slightly longer than two sentences, that. but I mean, it's, it's, it is great knowledge for us to to be able to receive so thank you um you're you know you mentioned it, of course that you were on the the apprentice and you have been in the public eye for some part of your life and do you think during that particular time in your life and when you had trauma and um you were facing adversity do you think being in the public eye made it easier or more, more difficult for you to to handle um we, oh horrific when everything happened um with my girl's father that was absolutely horrific because we weren't together um i was with my new partner like new relationship really happy um and the day after it, it hit the the news they had journalists knocking at his parents door it was just, it was absolutely horrific i remember going to an event i got booked to go to an event but they only booked me because of what had happened because they knew the event would get press with the journalists and it was it was horrific. It, it was absolutely horrific. In just, I think I think I've got a bit of PSD from that. Um, but yeah, it definitely it definitely made it. It was just a lot. It was a lot. And mm. I think around that time, it was very difficult personally. And then every single day, there was article after article, really negative. Really, I just I don't know. And then I felt really guilty because well, because his family having to read stuff and. It, it just was. It just wasn't a good place at all. It, it was horrific. I mean, that's a. There are sometimes we get in our head that being in the public eye can be better in these situations because you get that public support. Did you have any public support at all? Yeah, I did actually. I had loads of public support, um, and it's really funny. I think when you have stuff that happens like trauma, and you. A lot of people do search for validation and I honestly thought I wanted this fame, this stardom, this everything. Whereas actually coming out of Big Brother and The Apprentice was probably the most miserable, uncertain and insecure that I've ever been in my life. And it was only really when that tragedy happened did I come back to reality and I was like, what the hell have I been doing? And I found that my priorities were all wrong during that period. Um, whereas now despite anything that's happened and everything that's happened, this is probably the most content and happy I've been. I don't really have massive lows anymore. I don't I have massive highs, but it's generally it's it's level. And I've not really experienced that. But I do think that's because I've done a hell of a lot of work on my belief systems, confidence, self-esteem. Whereas I wouldn't have done that um if that wouldn't have happened. Hmm. And Joe, um no just like me, we're we're both professional football players and for me, when I was suffering, so, from it, I, I found it really difficult to deal with that, deal with that. Publicly, publicly or 
in, in, in my case, but still being in, you know, in public. Yeah. I found it difficult to perform. Obviously, in your case, you weren't performing, you weren't playing, so you were uh, underground. But did you find that more difficult, or did you find it easier going through what you did with the support of the public, or did you feel like find it more difficult? You know what, it was, um, it's difficult because when I look back at it now, I often think, would I have done anything different? Um, no, I'm absolutely blessed and privileged that I'm still here. But at times, it was quite overwhelming. Um, I did feel at both times, you know, particularly with uh, the second lot of treatment, because I was in isolation, I would be on my phone a lot. Um, searching for a positive message, searching for something to keep me going. Um, and obviously, all the in the back of your mind, you've got your family, how are they dealing with things, you know? Um, and I, I always, you know, try and keep as much private as possible. But I also knew that if I could get myself through this, and with so many people watching and knowing about the story, that it would inspire and give so much people hope to, uh, you know, get through it themselves because I just classed it as a setback. Yeah, um, yeah. And how was I going to overcome this setback and what was I going to do to get through it? But at times it was quite overwhelming, you know, even just a message like you can get through it. I was thinking to myself, I'm all for that positive message, but we don't actually know that I'm going to be all right. And, you know, it is touch and go because obviously I'm in contact with the doctors all the time. So I know where I'm at and yeah, when I'm yeah. struggling. Um, and it was scary at times. There's no getting away from it. And Dom, we lost you, but we've got you back now. But going back to, to your story, see the fact that you're, you're now four years sober, um, we didn't actually quite get to hear what you were saying, but but what is it that led you to to kind of to falling into that? Yeah, fingers crossed this works now. Yeah, perfect. That's perfect. Good. Good. Um yeah, so as you said, I was I'm four years sober. Um and I kind of um when I started the business, uh, I was just a normal guy. I had kind of no background in business experience. And uh about 18 months in, um, we'd had this massive growth curve. Things were going fantastic for us. Uh, we were working with some of the world's biggest brands and um, it was great. And, you know, and we never really suffered adversity. Um, and then we started to, to get into like the normal issues in business that you face, like cash flow, people leaving um, and that kind of point you point you reach. Uh, and we'd see the bank balance in the company going down and down and down and down bills coming up, tax bills, the usual stuff you expect. Um, and at this same point, I was turning to alcohol as kind of like, at first it was a celebration. So we had tons of things to celebrate and we had great wins all the time and it, real highs, you know, great opportunity, fantastic stuff. Um, but I kept on at the same level when even when I was feeling low. Mm -hmm. So I kept turning to alcohol when I was low and then it started to become... I started to come to, like depend on it so it would go from you know the friday saturday night fun parties to wednesday night having two bottles of wine and then getting up the next day to go to work um and it, yeah and it was a very very quick spiral into my life revolving around alcohol um and i was ultimately at the point where i knew it i was no, i never knew i was told by other people people around me people who were looking out for me that it, it had is having an impact on me. Mm. I couldn't see it myself because it was just normal for me. Um, so it wasn't until people around me who I really cared about were telling me that you you you've changed as a person. You're different. Um, you, you're not a nice person. You know you you've got a problem. That I suddenly realised. God, uh, I need to do something about this. Yeah. And did you did you find that it was more difficult because of your age? Did you find that there was social pressure on you to? When you did decide to 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 sort of stop drinking and and go sober, did you find it was more difficult because of the pressure from from other people who who were probably going out quite a lot? Yeah, I mean, being twenty three and sober, you know, what else there is what else is there to do? 
<laughs> what else you do on a Friday night? So um, that, that for me, there was a lot of pressure. You know, there was um, a lot of social pressures. There was a lot of even in you know professional world when you go into cocktail and you know, go to drinks and everything like that revolves around alcohol. There's so many situations where I couldn't get away from it. Um, so I had to remove myself from the situations because I knew I couldn't cope. I knew I'd be tempted or I knew I'd put, like just relapse by um, thinking, why am I doing this? So for me, it was really a struggle in the first six months to to know what to do because I couldn't see my friends because every time my friends did something, they were going out. I couldn't hang around the office on Friday to have to, have to drinks because everyone was having drinks. So I had to really exclude myself from normality um, as a 23 year old. And that that um, that period there, it was still challenging because I was still at home isolating where I used to drink. So yeah. I still was taking myself to the environment where I was actually causing myself the most damage, but it was ultimately the safest for me. Um, so I really, I really did struggle with that. Fortunately, um, fortunately, there were some pockets of people who were very supportive, who were always there for me. And I was very vocal that I needed to do this. Uh, it was the ones who told me I needed to make a change. So they helped me with it. Um, but kind of the wider circles, they couldn't understand why someone so young would want to go sober or needs to be sober. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that probably made things very, very difficult for you at that time. Um, just a quick reminder to everyone and to you guys as well that we're going to do a minute applause for the NHS at eight o'clock, so which is in six minutes. Um, of course, everybody knows the great job that they're doing, and, and I'm sure, Joe, you you know firsthand just how great they are and amazing they are and very undervalued in, in general really so and of course the 50 percent of the donations that people have made will be going to towards nhs charities together as well um so if i stop you <laughs> in next question of course that isn't because of you that is because we need to to start applauding um but as we move on, uh, going to Jess, this is now a question to all of you, but I'll start with Jess. Um, so one big thing is when we're stuck almost in the eye of the storm in adversity, when we're, you know, just, just, we just can't see beyond where we're at, where we're at right now. So for you during that period, and obviously this is to, to all of you as well, how did you see things were going to improve? Do you know what I think? Again, since growing up or since being my dad is like the most positive person you'd ever meet in your bloody life. So his personality is definitely rubbed off on me. Um, and then obviously reading loads of self-help and self-development books and um, just books to do with like mindset and psychology. This is the stuff that I absolutely buzz off. Um, I love learning how people work. I love learning how the brain works. So again, in probably my early 20s, actually, um, this is when I properly started looking into our brains. And I used to have a really negative thought process. I'd have one negative thought, and the next I'm like, oh, it's all going wrong. What the hell? Um, and then I started, I started thinking, well, if my brain works this way, surely it should work another way. And then I started looking at super successful people uh, and what they were doing. And then I got into the law of attraction, which I'm, I'm pretty sure that you <laughs> guys, if you're successful, yeah. you're definitely into the law of attraction. Um, and I really started looking into that. And then I really started looking into Tony Robbins. Um, I started doing all the incantations, like every day I'm getting better and better, doing all this mental stuff. Um, but it worked. And then literally every time I'd have one negative thought, I'd make myself think of five to 10 positive thoughts. So then that started getting new, like new ways of thinking. And automatically when I ha I'd have a negative, I'd see the positive and never mind what happened. Like when my memories came back and I was like, what the fuck? I did not expect this. Um, but then I realized like at first of all, I felt very much like a victim. I was like, you know, I can't believe this has happened to me. Why has this happened to me? And then I flipped it. I was like, well, if this had to happen to me, because it, if this wouldn't have happened when I was younger, I wouldn't have this grit. I wouldn't have this drive. I wouldn't have this determination. <laughs> I just, I wouldn't be me. And I actually quite like me. And again, when everything happens, um, Reese, I can't talk too loud because the, the, the kids are in the room, but when everything happened then, um, there's no other choice. I can choose to be miserable yeah. or I could choose to look for a positive out of it. I mean, the positives around that situation were very little, but it made me come back to reality. It made me step up even further as a mum and it put everything back in alignment for me. 
Um, and actually, it made me refocus on my business, not prat around, not prat around going out. Um, yeah, it's just uh, that's that you've 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 always got a choice. And the thing is, shit things happen to everyone. Bad yeah. things happen to everyone. But we always have a choice. That's the beauty of being a human. We've got free will. We can choose how we react to situations. And sometimes we may not react with a smile. We may not feel like reacting, jumping up and down, especially if it's something awful that happens. Who would? But then work through it, feel it, and then choose to see the positive. Choose to find a positive because there's always a silver lining. Mm. And do we have that on record? That was quite good, wasn't it, Marvin? <laughs> it's actually being recorded. I can actually clip it up and send it to you. Uh, I mean, I was going to ask what gave you hope, but it's clear well you can answer of course but it, it seems to me that it's very clear that your hope came from a your dad but b it's just something that was instilled in you that you you always saw there there was something there was always a silver lining to to latch onto i think as well like because i've got children they were really when you're like i think i think when everything came but like literally this is two weeks before i went to the apprentice and I think when everything came back, I think I went into a bit of traumatic, like a bit of depression, traumatic stress, and I just didn't cope very well. And I, I think I built a wall around me where I was blocking everything out. And then when Mike's partner died, um, I just, I started to feel again, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then that's when I really, I just, I just realized that I was taking a lot of, um, a lot of the things that I'm truly grateful for now for granted. Um, but yeah, I think my kids, yeah, my kids definitely give me hope. They're amazing. Yeah, I've got two and <laughs> don't get me wrong, the homeschool is <laughs> testing me. It is, it, yeah, it's it is it just... the green as well. Yeah, I've got three. <laughs> right, we've got thirty seconds. So I mean I'll be going to, to Joe next. I will 30 seconds sometimes sounds very long and sometimes very short. No, we can wait for me. You know, like you said before, I think it's about respecting the nurses because without those guys, not just myself, but so many that wouldn't be uh, here today. Yeah, like perfectly said. Okay, so we're going to applaud for the NHS. Oh. Let's see if anyone's outside. <laughs> I can hear my whole room actually. The window closed. Yeah, I can hear it outside. I live quite rural. There's <laughs> like about four hours. <laughs> it is amazing though. Like when you see uh, like the was it last week, wasn't it? Yeah. You saw the response. It's just absolutely incredible. You feel people's energy. It's amazing. Massive, yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 so important that they're appreciated anyway. Right, it just. It, it just feels like something is is it's sad that something so bad in the in the terms of the pandemic has has brought the country together. Mm. Well, you see it in America the way they treat the armed forces. Yeah. You know, the, the armed forces, every single baseball game you're at, every single yeah. time you're playing, the armed forces are just given everything you know, you've got so much respect for them and we should have a similar level for the NHS. without a shadow without um so <laughs> continuing and going back to, to you joe so when you were probably in the you know, when we talk about being in the first week, right in the, in the in the eye of the storm probably when you were going through the therapy yards Mm. Say again, Marvin, you're just breaking up. Have we lost him? Joe, are you still there? I'm still here, yeah, yeah. I just can't, you can't hear him either. No, I think he's dropped off. Jess yes. is still here. So is the three. <laughs> here he comes. Hello. Hello. 
the moral of the story, mate. It never quite goes to plan, but it's how you overcome it, I suppose. Exactly. Of course, exactly. Um, yeah, we might as well just carry it quite straight back on. Um, I'm not sure what happened there. No, I didn't hear the question at all, so go on, fire yeah, away. Yeah. So during that period, of course, um, you know, we talk about adversity. You being probably in chemotherapy, probably you know, the eye of the memory in, in your sense. Did you see that things were going to improve or at all? Um, I, this is why I was so enthusiastic to, you know, to come on here and talk about it because for me, I hit rock bottom. Um, I was in, when I got put on the isolation unit, uh, you get told you'll be in there for six to eight weeks. Uh, so even that's just hard to get your head around, yeah. um, you know, for your sanity and for your mental health that no one's ever told us up until now that you can't go out that door, um, until you've kind of told so, uh, yeah. so that was tough to take. And then I was to undergo seven days of like the most toxic and potent chemotherapy going. Uh, and then it's just a wait and see process. Um, and the harsh reality of it was I was either going to walk out on my own two feet or, you know, it was going to be the worst case scenario. So it got to a point where it was about 13 days in where I really hit rock bottom. Um, and all the time I'm having all this treatment and chemotherapy, I'm losing weight, I've lost all my hair. So I was nine and a half stone in the end. Um, so visually to look at, even when I looked at myself in the mirror, I was struggling to see the hope. Um, but I think it's important and it's, it's nice to see what people are doing like over the last couple of weeks is to really home in on what's important to you, um, what matters to you, who cares to you. And, you know, Jess spoke about her children before. It was a similar case with me. You know, I've got a beautiful wife and a beautiful daughter. And it was a case of I'd not seen them for so long and I missed them. Uh, and I spoke to Chantel, my wife, and just said, bring Lula in um, on Father's Day. And that was, you know, a couple of days away. And that was going to be my reminder, I suppose, of who I was fighting for, what I was fighting for. Um, and she came in the room, you know, she was shocked at my appearance. You know, it's it's something that, you know, Jess was talking about childhood traumas and so I'm sure it's a vision and a visual that she will have remembered for the rest of her life. But she checked the machines, gave me a few grapes and stuff like that and went about a business like Dot stuff Stuffins. And then she just asked me, Daddy, are you going to die? And I was like, wow, you know, I can't give you that honest answer right now. But the one thing I'll always tell my daughter and others is, you know, if you give it your best, uh, what will be will be. And the, the one thing I was never going to do was give up. You know, if it went the other way and I, I lost my fight and my battle, then all I could ever say to my family is that I just got beaten and I gave it my all. So it was, for me, it was about recreate, uh, recreating certain memories and reconnecting with, you know, the people that I valued and loved so much. And for you, Dom, how did you manage to to find hope? Yeah, great, great question. And Joe, it's just great to hear your answers as well and what you you guys have been through. You know, honestly, it's incredible to hear. Uh, for me, I was um, I didn't really know day one what um, was causing the problem, so I didn't really have any answers. Uh, it was a lot of unknown, unknown. So. I was blaming everything outside of my control. I was blaming things like my friends. I was blaming things like work and I was blaming um, everything apart from myself. And what really helped me was to um, look in at me and like realize that the problem that I, I had, I had created and that I was responsible for it. Uh, no one else was responsible for making the, this happen. No, no one else was responsible for getting me um, dependent on alcohol. It was all myself. And once I realized that it was me who got myself into this situation, I realized that I could be the one that got myself out, myself out of it. So I knew I had to look inside myself um, and stop blaming everyone else and start blaming, blaming myself and then start taking steps into trying to reconnect with the person I wanted to be rather than the person I am now. So I realized that, that who I was being wasn't aligning with my values. And I was like, I'm not this person, this drunk, um, short, tempered, um, almost a bit of, you know I won't be friends with that person um so I wanted to like really picture my values and really picture who I was 
and want it to be and focus completely on the, the, the things which are valuable to me, which is exactly what you guys are saying in terms of your family. You know, I went and told my mum, who I think is on this stream listening, that um, everything about me, everything that I've gone through. And she told me she didn't recognise me as a person. And that for me was a really hard moment to take where your own mother who has known you for 23 years doesn't recognise the person you've become. And that was a real wake up call where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I've become a different person. Um, so my friends, my family, uh, and also, you know, my, my girlfriend and work gave me purpose. Um, they gave me purpose, you know, of getting through this. Um, I still had the company to run. I still had uh, commitments there, ambitions there. And that purpose, um, along with understanding what my values are and who I wanted to be as a person, got me through it. Um, because I just focused completely on them, my purpose and my values. And I, I began to overcome the negative behaviors that I had. Um, but without a purpose, you know, something to get up out of every single day, something you believe in, something you, you know, you're trying to do, I would really struggled. Yeah. So would you say hope and purpose are essentially one and the same? Yeah. Yes and no. Um, I think hope can come from within you as well um you can you can hope you can hope without having the purpose you know a lot of people still don't find their their purpose they don't have that nailed nailed on thing but i think hope is you are still looking for that mm. you know you you can have that some, that inside you where you are you are an ambitious person you're trying to find out what direction you need to have on to and if you don't have your purpose like decided as long as you've got that kind of energy of hope inside of you you can still overcome adversity great great answer and now we we talk about how you manage to get through it so you know you're you're all very successful people in your own right and I'll go back to Jess to start with it's how did you manage to not only survive you know that that period of time but to use it to to be the start of your your success story do you know that's a really difficult question to answer because i think whatever you go through, you don't really realise what you've been through until someone points it out to you because you're just living day by day. <laughs> and then when actually you take a moment to look at what you've accomplished, or, and also as well, bloody hell, I used to suffer with the worst imposter syndrome, and I'm assuming quite a few of you know what this is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I do like an amazing job of people. I'm like, oh, my God, they're going to they're gonna figure out my fraud here. They're going to figure out that I'm bloody winging this, that I don't know what I'm doing. But then I did all this work that I'm doing, you, you just don't realise, I think you just don't realise what, you, what you're what capable of unless you just do it. And yeah. that's it. And I think, like like what um, Dom said, there are people out there that they don't have the purpose yet. But yeah, most people say, you know, if you find your purpose, you'll never work a day in your life. And I used to listen to that, be like, well, I'm not doing my purpose. But then I was curiosity led. So let my curiosity just take me wherever. And always, I've always believed it doing things that are fun because you're here once so i've had business businesses before and if they were making me miserable and i didn't have the light for them i'd switch them off i wasn't afraid to come out of that business and to focus on something that i loved that give me energy and i think especially in our culture not a lot of people will tell you it's okay it's okay not to do something you dislike in our culture a lot of people are like oh stick to it stick with it but sticking with it can make you freaking miserable. Sticking with it can make you stressed, can make you ill, can make you not a nice person. Um, so for me, I think I got through it or worked through everything. I always made sure I had fun when I was doing things. And when things got stressful, I'd, I'd check in with myself, like, right, why am I feeling like this? And then a few of the techniques that I do, which is EFT, NLP, and matrix tree and printed, it helps you to understand why you are reacting in a certain way and get rid of it. And also, just for anyone who's listening, anyone who does get anxiety, panic or fear irrationally, it's because you've been triggered to do with a certain situation. And if you are suffering with that, you can actually get rid of it. You can eliminate those feelings and you can do it, not, don't say relatively easy or quickly, because it all depends how complex um, the situations are. But you can overcome it and you can get rid of it. And there is always, always, always light at the end of the tunnel, regardless how dark it feels now. Hmm. And for you, Joe, <laughs> <laughs> and for you, Joe, like what? What? I mean, 
you yeah. it's incredible to see you know, you survived cancer twice and you went back to playing professional football. So how like how how did you manage to to get to that point where you're scoring the goal that, that keeps your team in the league? Um I had a lot of people that I wanted to repay, I suppose. You know, it changed my life, don't get me wrong. Um through all those dark days, you know, I'm a better person, um, a better dad, a better uh, husband, and, you know, just a better person all around. But for me, I think first time round, I wanted to prove people wrong. Mm. Um, a lot of people said I couldn't do it um, after having so much treatment. Second time round was totally different. I was fed up with trying to prove anybody wrong or right. And I just wanted to um, achieve one more kind of moment for myself and my family. Uh, the way it panned out um, was um, obviously quite remarkable in the fact that it came to the last day of the season and my team were fighting for survival against the local rivals. And, you know, the kind of the survivor made sure everybody survived. Uh, but that was just my present gift. Um back to my teammates for supporting me um, because they'd been through that journey and everybody had been through it with me within football. And like I said previous, it was quite overwhelming. Um, but I, it given me that, that fight and desire. Even though I couldn't physically train day in, day out, I knew that it was given the opportunity. And my manager, you know, thankfully for me, put his faith and trust in me and I was able to repay that uh, in tenfold. And, I probably didn't realise up until a few days later the kind of impact it had. Mm. Um, and I was in the process of writing my book, Darkness and Light, and I managed to run out of Wembley a couple of months prior, and they said, yeah, that's the ending. You know, the publishers were happy with that, and I was like, there's no way that's the ending. We've just got beat 6-1 off Tottenham in the FA Cup replay. That's not giving anybody any hope. And then as soon as I scored that winner on the last day of the season, I was like, We'll bring the book to print now um, because it was hard facts. You know, everyone has seen it. It was, I didn't realize that it was on Sky on the day I was too like engrossed and in the zone. And I just knew that all that work and sacrifice that I'd put myself through um, and often people had called me crazy. You know, the doctors were tearing their hair out that I'd even thought about running back out on a football pitch. But it was all that I knew and it was all that I wanted to do. But I had started putting things in place so I knew that I could transition out of football as and when. Yeah. I mean, amazing. Amazing story. The, the goal at the end is probably the chain on top of you know, a very difficult few years. So. Yeah, and it is, you know with football how hard it is. Um, there is ups and downs every day. Yeah. Um, my life to a certain degree, even prior to, you know, cancer, um, had been tough. My mum suffers from mental illness and bipolar. Um, so I, I'd grown up understanding and, you know, seeing the issues that surround mental health. Um, and for me, it was, it was a mental test for me. Um, but you like you say, to score that goal on the end of the day was, you know, clarity in a way. And, it made all that hard work, blood, sweat and tears at times worth it, I suppose. And for you, Dom? Yeah, like, like I was saying, um, your body goes through things and you don't realise how much you come out the other side a better person. Um, giving up alcohol, the I, I was that person who, if you looked at them, you think could never stop drinking. Hmm. I was the party boy. I was always out and about. Um, I was... Actually, when I left school at 18, we did the end of year awards and I won most likely to be drunk right now. <laughs> and, you know, that was maybe an early sign. Um, but that was me. You know, that was, that was the life I lived. I was always up for going out, always up for having fun uh, before I kind of got into a negative, negative relationship. So I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I could do it. No one around me thought I could do it. Um, and it was only when I started started it, I realized how much of a big journey it was going to be. Um, and looking back on it after the kind of the first year, 
it's a little bit of a, a blur, really. I don't really remember what I did in that year. Um, but I, I looked back and was like, this is incredible. I, I had people who, um, in the in a professional sense, in a personal sense, I really look, looked up to. So some friends who play football, some friends who are athletes, some friends who have started businesses. And they were all saying, I could never do what you've done. And that for me was really bizarre to hear. I was like, you guys are doing things that I dream about and you guys have done some incredible things in your life and you're telling me you couldn't just not drink alcohol and I was like really and and that for me made me really realize that um it was a really big learning learning curve uh, and a real big achievement Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I really start to look in again look inwards and be like okay what have I actually learned over these you know first year of, of stopping drinking you know what I've What's it done for me in terms of my mental health, my clarity? Um, and I kind of, you know, it took, it did take about a year to really reflect on it and really, really appreciate how far I'd come in the journey. And um, yeah, it, it set me up for, set me up for um, anything really, because it, like you say, it was the one thing I, I didn't think I could ever do. So then when I started doing other challenges, like running a marathon or anything like doing work, it was just another thing to to accomplish. You know, I'd started at the the kind of pinnacle of doing something I never thought I could do. So everything else underneath that felt achievable. So I reached for the stars and then everything else underneath was just there. Um, And it sounds so bizarre that all I'm saying that my kind of North Pole stars was just stopping drinking, but it it was, and then it just made everything else feel possible. Um, Sorry, I'm just aware that we're running short on time so a last question um for each of you before i i will give you all um a question if we get any questions for a question q a but what advice would you give someone who is either currently facing adversity or who may face adversity at some point in the future and i'll start with jess and i'll go back around again Okay, so first and foremost, regardless how you feel in this situation, you will get through it and there is always a way out, even if you feel it's the worst thing that could ever happen, there's always a way out. If you're going through adversity now, there's a few little techniques you can try to help you stop feeling a certain way. And if you just Google, I know I've got, just knows I've got a few of my clients on here I've done this with, but if you Google EFT, meridian points, anxiety, panic, fear, um, depression, whatever it is you're feeling, if you use this technique, it just lifts that feeling. And this thing, I think with the, the messaging to do with mental health and the campaign is talk to someone. But there's a lot of people out there who can't talk to anyone because they feel shame, they feel embarrassed, they feel all these things. The message should be as well, here are some techniques to get you to a place where you can talk to someone. And that's it. If you're going through a tough time or if you or if a tough time happens, search for the positive. Speak to somebody who makes you happy. Like watch motivational videos, read inspiring quotes. I know this sounds cheesy, but this is the stuff that will temporarily change the way you think and feel, and then work on that. When you instantly change it, work on it, and build it. Great, great answer. Boom. <laughs> Joe, try and top that. I got to echo everything that Jess says there. You know, I live by a mantra, and it goes by the. Don't live life to survive, live life to thrive. But what I mean by that is everybody's got their own adversities, you know, own troubles, own issues. And what might affect me might not affect you. And everyone's different. But like Jess said before, find the positives. Um, you First of all, I suppose you've got to, like Dominic spoke about before, admit, you know, you're going through something and you're struggling. Um, and then deal with it the best way you can. And I'll always say never give up. Um, because you're going to make a breakthrough. You've got to meet resistance. So no one's ever going to say it's easy, but don't ever give up because you will find light at the end of that tunnel. And Dom? Yeah, you know, them guys, you guys have summed it up perfectly. Um, not much left to say, really, apart from um, everyone's got their own own kind of level of degree of adversity. Um, I don't think there's a moment in life where you – where people are not struggling with adversity, 
you will go through something. Um, and as we've said throughout this panel, life is about 80% uh, how you react to things and 20% what happens. And if you spend uh, so much time focusing on what happens and not on how you react to things, you'll never move on past it. So really, for, like really, things will happen, things will go wrong, um, but it's the reaction you have afterwards and how you deal with them which will s dictate where you go. Um, I always think about you know the glow sticks that you have when you were a kid where they snap and they light light up. I think that's a really good metaphor for for for, for life is that when when you break, it can be the start of you really shining. Um, and it can really be the start of something special. Um, so always look for in adversities and around times when you're struggling, what you can take from it and how you can improve. Um, and don't always, always try and never look on it in a negative light. I love that. Amazing. Um, let me just quickly have a look if there are any questions. It's mostly people saying the mics are not good or <laughs> they can't see someone or there's an echo uh yeah oh there's one question for jess um and there's a couple more coming in actually um I'm nervous now. <laughs> how would you recommend overcoming limiting thoughts and specifically feelings of being an imposter in your career Okay, so when you have a thought, that thoughts always bring feelings up. Now, when you have a feeling, whether it's panic, whether it's shame, whatever it is, if you just close your eyes now, if you feel that feeling and just tap on the crown of your head and just ask, where does that come from? When was the first time I felt this? And usually what would happen, a memory will come up about the time you felt like that before. And then you want to, it sounds mental. I mean, these, this is what I use with my clients. I, I use my Tibetan bells. <laughs> And then I've got a singing bowl, but this looks crazy. But the reason I use this, it allows me to get to the subconscious. And that's where we hold on to the shit. So tap when you feel a certain way. Ask, when was the first time I felt this? And memories will come up. And then keep asking you in your memory when you felt like this before. And it will take you back and back and back. And then you'll understand why you feel like that. And it instantly shifts. Um, and then another broad question to to anybody who would like to answer are there any key books you would you've read that you guys would recommend that would help to kickstart that positive change and any that really inspired you yeah i'll jump in uh so i can one book book really saved my life and it was the chimp paradox if anyone's my read one. it yeah. uh, and exactly the yeah. same saved my life save my life same I, I referenced that book for saving my life um for sure so yeah chimp paradox by Dr. Stephen Peters, hands down, best book I've ever read. Yes. Um, okay, so Tim Ferriss, The 4-Hour Week. Whoa, game changer. <laughs> um, and then also The Monk That Sold His Ferrari by Robin Sharman. That was the book that changed my life when I was 17. And Joe, other than you're obviously, obviously uh, yours. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, no, there's so many books. Um, but even if you're not a big reader, I think, you know, everyone wants to be on the computer. I'm always what you follow on social media, um, YouTube. You can search whatever you want, anything's at your disposal now. So, you know, there's so many things that you can find positives from. Um, but it's like I say, it's about understanding you as a person. You might find inspiration from one story and someone else might find inspiration from others. But there's loads of books out there and yeah. loads of audibles. So, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't like reading. Well, get yourself in the car and instead of listening to uh, the radio, put an audible on. Cool. Um, let me have a look at the one last one we can get that isn't telling us that we've still got echo <laughs> um somebody has mentioned here that uh we talked about experiencing a form of isolation in in the past what are your top tips to get us through our current isolation situation learn something <laughs> like literally i would focus on learning something new when i was in big brother i learned how to juggle um learn the guitar um, never stop learning and get active and eat well. Like eat if you can eat well. Eat well, learn and stay active. Good. My, my, we are we're all in the same situation, so everyone feels the same. So speak, 
other people, speak to your family, speak to your friends, share how you're feeling, and we'll be together and we'll get through it. For me, I would have to say music. You know, I listen to so much music, so much positive music. Um, obviously, like Dom said there, speak to the people that matter to you. You know, everyone's away from their loved ones. Um, but yeah, make sure you're checking in with them and make sure, you know, you're telling them how much you appreciate them and love them uh, because we will get through this. It's just something that we're having to overcome together. But I do think it will um, change the perspective on obviously our generation and the generation to come. And um, there's actually one more question that's just come in, which I'll allow. Um, which is again for all, but it says, but for Dom, to what degree do you rely on spiritual tools, prayer, meditation for your recovery or keeping the line as just mentioned? Yeah. Um, for me, like I did go on like a journey of, um, connecting with like, uh, spirit, spirituality. Um, I, I'm actually like a practicing Quaker. Uh, so that's a whole nother conversation. Uh, but I went to a Quaker school and I learned the importance of uh, Quaker values. And that really helped me uh, connect when I was going through going sober. So it was really important for me. Um, but again, it came from me finding my values and my values line with Quakerism, which really, which was kind of what, what helped. Do you know, just touching on that. So there's a book which, and again, like I give up alcohol and I give it up about four or five months ago. And it was because I was drinking quite a bit. And again, when I when I tried to not drink alcohol, I couldn't go a week. I'd like have a glass of Prosecco yeah. and then have another one that I'd have the bottle. Um, and I listened to a book by a woman called Annie Grace on Audible. And it's called This Naked Mind. And since listening to it, she's got a really sexy voice. It's like, yeah, she talks like this. So she kind of hypnotizes you. But after listening to that, whenever I felt that pull to alcohol, I'd just been like, oh, no, I don't want it. No. And it goes through the like the psychology of alcohol. She talks about um, how we are conditioned to associate with certain things. And it's really made me not want it. So maybe look into that if, yeah, uh, well, I don't know. That's I mean, I, yeah, that's just something I felt like I needed to say. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, guys. Joe, thank you. Dom, thank you. And Jess, as well. Thanks My pleasure. Can I get a here? Everyone smile. <laughs> Wrong time to have the flash on. <laughs> Hang on, let me turn it off and let's try it again. Okay, this time, smile. Yeah, I've got it. Great. Happy days. And thanks to everyone who listened, watched from wherever you are and asked questions and answered. Um, it's amazing listening yeah. to everyone. Everyone's so I know, it's amazing. I've taken a lot from it personally, so great. It's what it's all about, though, you know, and I think what you've created, Marvin, within the space of, you know, you come to me about a week ago, it's incredible. <laughs> um, and I think it's what people need at this moment in time, you know, yeah, for right, people right. being open and honest about the troubles and how they've overcome it. So yeah. salute to you and hats off. If my hair wasn't so bad under here, <laughs> I'd take it off, mate. Go on, Joe, let's have a look. <laughs> no, you can't do that to me, Jess. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you guys. And we'll speak again, I'm sure, in the future. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.